wonderful to see, um, you know, familiar names and familiar faces and, uh, and new names and new faces. And they're just starting more people are just starting to um, stream in now. Um, my name is Brian Athey and I'm the uh, chair and uh, Savage Oak Collegiate Professor in the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics. And Sally, this is our 16th year of our seminar series, which is scary. Uh, you know, we officially started that when we moved over to Palmer Commons in the fall of 2005. So it's just, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're, and actually we have one of the largest collections of bioinformatics seminars uh, in terms of YouTubes uh, in the entire planet. And it's a resource and uh, Aaron Kupfich who is uh, our webmaster extraordinaire and who's now a Zoom master on top of it and is managing this um, seminar series on the technical side. And Jane Weisner, who is, uh, uh, is uh, helping to organize this, she's done for many, many years the bioinformatics seminar. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Josh Welsh and his partner, G. Lu, is on another meeting right now, but the two of them have reorganized uh, for this um, fall 2020 term, the uh, 16th annual bioinformatics seminar. So Josh, you, put to, you and G have put together a tremendous uh, panel, not the least of which is our first speaker, our old friend, Sally Camper from Human Genetics. So I'd like to give you the honors to introduce Sally at this time, Josh, and launch our seminar series under the okay. under your your watchful eye with uh june and g and uh and and uh, and uh jane and aaron welcome everybody great thanks brian welcome everybody and it's my pleasure to introduce dr sally camper um she's the marjorie w shaw distinguished university professor of human genetics at the university of michigan she received her PhD in biochemistry from Michigan State and did her postdoc at the Institute for Cancer Research in Philadelphia and Princeton University. Dr. Camper has had a very distinguished career and received numerous honors and awards, including the 2021 Endocrine Society Laureate Award, which was just announced a few days ago, and the Women in Endocrinology Mentoring Award, also from the Endocrine Society, the Rackham Distinguished Graduate Mentoring Award, the NIH Merit Award, and an appointment as a AAAS fellow. She's published almost 200 peer-reviewed publications and is an internationally recognized leader in the genetics of birth defects, including abnormalities in neuroendocrine, auditory, and skeletal development. And in addition to maintaining her successful research lab, she also served as the chair of the human genetics department for 11 years. So Sally, thanks so much for agreeing to speak with us and we're excited for your talk. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's quite an honor. And I wanted to thank Alan Boyle and Josh and Dr. Liu for giving me this chance to talk with everybody. Um, can everybody see my screen okay and hear me all right? It's coming through good, Sally. Looks okay. Good. Just need to... Um, I don't have any disclosures, but if anybody knows where I could get some money that I'd need to disclose, I'd be happy to hear about it. <laughs> the pituitary gland is um, a small organ located at the base of the brain that gets its um, input from the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamic input regulates the production of a whole collection of polypeptide hormones that are so important for many body functions, including growth, metabolism, lactation, the stress response, and fertility. Deficiencies in pituitary hormones are not uncommon, and it's a primary reason for referral of children to endocrinologists is growth insufficiency. It occurs about one four thousand births. And it can be simple, just growth hormone insufficiency, or it can be combined with other hormone deficiencies. And those kind of cases can be um, treated effectively with recombinant growth hormone, like this famous uh, soccer player here um, who had growth hormone deficiency. 
Um, but often the pituitary hormone deficiencies are combined with other types of, of um, craniofacial abnormalities that can be very disfiguring and uh, cause reduced quality of life. For example, holoprosencephaly, where the two hemispheres of the brain don't separate properly and there are severe defects in vision. A milder form with septo-optic dysplasia where the optic nerve is hypoplastic and there are brain abnormalities. Sometimes intellectual disability without craniofacial abnormalities. And sometimes um, defects in neurosensory systems such as the eye, ear, olfaction, or palate and lip. So this is really an important class of birth defects. It makes sense that these birth defects occur together sometimes when you think about how the face develops normally. There are facial prominences that have to grow at a very controlled rate to come together to make a you know, beautiful face. And um, so that growth has to be controlled very carefully. Also, at this time, about one to two months gestation, when a lot of women don't yet realize that they're pregnant, this is when all of this important stuff is taking place. And you can see in this electron micrograph of a human fetus, the various placodes, which are thickenings of the ectoderm that give rise to the eyes, the ears, the nose, etc. And the pituitary placode is the only one that's not uh, completely neuronal, and that's uh, in the oral cavity at, the, at this point, if you can see that right there. So it makes sense that there are genes that regulate the growth of these placodes and the growth of the face that can be mutated and have a whole range of spectrum of defects. So for the last couple of decades, we've been identifying genes that are mutated in hormone deficiency. And uh, some of those are listed here, kind of in a time course. And by now we know over 30 different genes that can be mutated in uh, individuals with these disorders. This pie chart I made from a retrospective article in the literature by an Italian group. And what they did is they looked back to see um, reports of patients screening what were the most commonly found genes that were mutated. And there's a bit of ascertainment bias because this is based on Sanger sequencing, kind of the guess and check method where you take the latest gene that's been identified and you screen for mutations in your cohort. And you can see that some of the earliest identified genes like PROP1 and PAL1F1, these are both transcription factors, account for a large portion of the genetic disease that's been a reported in the literature. And most of the cases, um, um, mutations were not found. But it's important to note that this is not systematic unbiased screening like by exome or by gene panel. One of the challenges in this field is the heterogeneity in clinical presentation. So I indicated that this is part of a spectrum disorder from severe to mild, where there's only one or two hormones deficient. And the thing that's frustrating <laughs> as a geneticist is that you can have a loss of function mutation in a gene like HESX1, and it can present in a variety of different ways in different patients. So we're very far away from precision medicine where we could predict a clinical phenotype knowing what the lesion is. And that's true for other genes like GLEE2 in the sonic hedgehog pathway or SOX3 or FGF8. So our hunch going in is that there are numerous genetic and environmental factors that work together to specify whether the phenotype is gonna be severe or more mild. And so there's a lot of work to be done to identify those things. So since this is computational medicine and bioinformatics, I picked out three uh, short stories that I thought would be of interest to your audience because they all have a very crucial bioinformatics component. And the first is our progress on screening Argentinian patients with hypopituitarism, which has been a big collaboration with Jacob Kitzman's lab and Kathy Smith, who's a student in your program. 
and um, a former postdoc of mine, Maria Inez Perez Milan, and a graduate student, Sebastian Vishnopolska, who we were delighted to be able to host here in Michigan for six months before this COVID mess. <laughs> and then I'm going to tell about a recent PhD student's work, Alex Daly, who, with um, excellent support from Steve Parker, completed identification of downstream targets of one of the key factors, PAL1F1 in pituitary thyrotropes. And then at the very end, I'll give you a little taste of what Leonard Chung has been doing, pioneering the application of single cell transcriptomics um, and his work in identifying rare cells that we think might be important in differentiation and disease. And I welcome you to um, interrupt me with a question or put something in the chat so we can make this as interactive as possible, even though we're not in the same room together. So um, first, uh, to tell you a little bit about this collaboration, um, Maria Inez Perez Milan is an assistant professor at University of Buenos Aires, who was a postdoc with me a number of years ago and now has her own lab. And, um, I presented some of our work at the human genetics faculty meeting and Jacob Kitzman jumped in and um, offered to collaborate with us and made a lot of these things possible. And I really wanna thank him and Kathy Smith for their input. When um, Dr. Perez Milan went back to Buenos Aires, she arranged collaborations with the two biggest pediatric hospitals there. Hospital Gutierrez and Garahan, one's a public and one's a private. And these two huge hospitals serve the whole city of Buenos Aires, which is 12.7 million people. And they also have a catchment where they draw from nearby countries sometimes. So it's a really fantastic patient population. Most of the cases um, that they see are sporadic where there's no family history, just a single affected child. Um, but sometimes they're familial cases, and we like those because it's more likely they're genetic, it's more likely we're going to find something and be sure it's real because we can follow the segregation and the pedigree. Um, we've analyzed 184 patients uh, for mutations in a select group of genes, and we have 200 more that were in progress. And so the technique that we've been using is one that's pioneered by the Kitzman lab, and it's basically like a selective exome capture. So instead of capturing all the exomes in the genome, we're only going to go for 67 genes that we're interested in that have already been shown to be mutated in holoprosencephaly, septoaptic dysplasia, or hypopituitarism, and a handful that we know from mouse that are candidates. So that amounted to 693 coding exons um, and 174 kilobases of coding sequence. And this is a really cost effective way to go because you can pool samples in, in, in a single sequencing run. You can get really good coverage of most of the area that you're interested in. So Jacob suggested that we use a human cell line. It's kind of a gold standard that's been very deeply sequenced and run that along with the patient samples. So we could be uh, do the QC to be sure that our, we're picking up all the variants that we should and we're not finding false variants. And so we got a really good concordance rate with that, and we were very pleased. So the um, pipeline for analysis um, is a pretty standard one um, that Jacobs Lab developed, a custom pipeline, which involves taking the raw reads and aligning them and trimming off um, the sequences that are artifacts of the method of capturing the exons and intron exon borders, and then um, calling the variants and uh, insertions and deletions, and then comparing those variants to population controls. And this is a tricky thing, um, which I wanna talk a little bit about, about matched controls and what we're trying to do to be robust with that. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the variants are filtered and um, we use a variety of pathogenicity programs to predict whether they're pathogenic. And we're going to, in the future, apply um, 
uh, Revel, Revel, however you say that, um, because that's been recommended as a, as a good, robust prediction tool, and implement splice uh, prediction programs as part of the algorithm. And you'll see why that is in the talk. So what about the Argentinian population? Uh, a lot of Americans think of it as a mostly European population, but actually that's not really true. There's a recent paper that came out with um, single nucleotide polymorphism type typing of individuals uh, from all over this big country that spans from Patagonia all the way up to Brazil and is flanked by the Andes and Chile. And you can see here Uruguay, Paraguay. It's a really big country. And 20 to 30 percent of the people have Native American ancestry. And in this paper, they identified three Native um, American groups, including one group that was unique and hasn't been described yet in Latin America. Um, about two to nine percent are African and from various places in Africa. These are um, slaves that were uh, taken from both East and West Africa. And finally, the European component and about 1% Asian. Um, so if you look at the European component, um, Argentina is the biggest Spanish speaking country in the world. And a lot of the people obviously come from the Iberian Peninsula, um, Spain or Portugal. Um, but there's also a strong component from other areas in Europe. And those we have good controlled databases for. So we've been collaborating with Marcelo Marti, who's the head of the Argentinian Genome Project. In 2012, they started with 100 exomes selected for um, highly suspect you know, genetic diseases. And um, in 2015, they started a, a national system for genomics data. And then in 2017, the Precision Medicine Initiative was started, which is focused on pediatric cases. So we don't have um, loads of normal controls, but we can use controls um, that have very distinct unrelated diseases that don't have anything to do with craniofacial uh, to look at the variants. And Sebastian is um, the first author on this paper that's come out about precision medicine in Argentina. So what did we find? And I have to say, I was really surprised. Only 8% of the cases that we checked in the first roughly 200 had pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in these known um, genes. So here's a list of the genes where we found variants and they're orange if they're predicted to be pathogenic or likely pathogenic and the the scourge of the variants of unknown significance are here in green. But we are stuck with this huge blue piece of pie, which is the people where there were no interesting variants in any of these genes. The other thing that I thought was a little curious is that we did not find any mutations in the transcription factor PROP1. Um, so these are common in um, there's two founder effects, one in Eastern Europe and one in the Iberian Peninsula. And so in certain populations, PROP1 mutations are quite common. None we found in this population. So I'm gonna not go through everything, but I'm just gonna give you two examples of the sorts of things we found um, and a taste for what it takes in the wet lab to uh, get to any conclusion on these things. So, um, we found three, mut three variants in the LHX3 gene, which is a well-known pituitary transcription factor. And um, these were each sporadic cases, so no family history. And two of the cases, case two and three, had the same variant, L220M. And the first case here is proline to serine. And in this cartoon, it's a little busy, but it shows all the previously reported variants and most of them are in purple, but because that, that means they had pituitary hormone deficiency. If they have a blue box or a black box, it means they had some other features like hearing or skeletal defects. 
And so the novel mutation here, one of them is right in the homeo domain, the DNA binding domain. So that really smells like a mutant, path, likely pathogenic variant. And the other is nearby. And, and these are highly conserved all the way through mammals, including birds and fish. And the same thing for this variant, highly conserved. But that's not good enough. You have to have some kind of functional test. Sometimes you can do modeling, molecular modeling here, where the double helix is in orange and the DNA binding domain is shown here, these helical structures. And the change that um, we found is predicted, the proline in the DNA binding domain really predicted to mess things up. And then if you look um, in a, a functional assay, so transient transfection in cells, where you take, say, the growth hormone promoter and uh, easy reported gene like luciferase, throw in LHX3 reference allele plus your variant, you can see that the proline to serine change did have a deleterious effect on function, but the other one didn't. It doesn't mean it's, we can't say from this that it's tolerated because maybe it interacts with some other protein we don't know about, but from this we have to say uh, it's probably not, um, we can't call it pathogenic, let me just say that. And so these kind of functional tests are incredibly time consuming. And that's why we really like the idea of being able to do a high throughput mutagenesis and just create a catalog that will tell us what any mutations might be. And that brings us to the second example I wanted to share with you. So this, is, this gene is POW1F1. It, it's the first pituitary transcription factor ever discovered and was discovered in mutant mice that were dwarf and then found to be mutated in human patients. And so I've collected the mutations um, that have been reported here. And you can see in purple, most of them cause multiple hormone deficiencies. Sometimes it's isolated, shown in blue. There's a few dominant alleles that have been described but most of them are recessive. And so there you go. It's a well-behaved gene. Almost all the patients have the same phenotype. It's usually recessive, easy, right? Okay, so we found in collaborations with individuals in France and Germany and Brazil, um, variants in a minor isoform of this transcription factor. So most of the time you splice from exon one to this area of exon two, which gives you this alpha isoform that's predominant. It's a strong transcriptional activator. But at some low rate, you splice to this position, a different splice acceptor. And this inserts 27 amino acids into the transactivation domain, switching it from a transcriptional activator to a repressor. So what is the meaning of these variants? It was kind of fun the way this, we discovered too in a collaboration with some, um, with Fred Castanetti and Theory Brew and we're at an endo meeting talking to some other people and found out, oh, there's actually two other families that have similar variants. And so we were lucky to be able to collaborate and, and look at this um, and see uh, what might, the mechanism of action be. And Peter Gergish was a former postdoc in my group who's now doing residency training and he took this functional study on. And there were two um, hypotheses that we wanted to test. One is, could these variants um, change the amino acid and turn this into a super repressor, you know, a really powerful repressor that would be dominant negative and cause disease? Or do they affect splicing and switch from having an activator to a repressor or some combination of those two models? And so um, the first thing Peter did was to create um, an assay for the activity of the repressor and um, activator isoforms. So we know that mutations in POW1F1 cause a lack of growth hormone, prolactin, and TSH and the cells that make these hormones are missing. We also know that POW1F1 activates its own transcription through an autoregulatory loop. So what Peter did is he took the regulatory region of POW1F1 
and put that on a luciferase reporter gene. And then he expressed each of the various forms of PAL1F1, the alpha, the reference allele of beta, and all the variant beta alleles. And what you can see in this transfection assay is that the alpha isoform here in red is very strongly activating, auto-activating. And if you put in half the amount of DNA, you get a little less, but it's still activating. And then if you add any of the beta isoforms, the reference allele, wild type, or the, any of the variants, they don't activate at all, which is kind of what we expected. And then the critical experiment is when you mix them in, mimicking a heterozygote effect. So you've got one N dose of the, of the alpha allele that would be coming from the normal allele. And then you've got the beta wild type or these variants. And you can see they all are able to repress the alpha. So they're not super repressors. They're, I think these are all about the same. So that means the first idea is out. Um, the, these missense alleles don't make super repressors. So the other idea was splicing. So we all learned back in biochem how splicing happens. And there's the invariant AG, G, uh, GTAG um, in the intron there for splicing. And there's the branch site. But that only uh, accounts for about half the information you need for a spliceosome to find where to splice. There are smaller six to 10 nucleotide uh, regions that bind RNAs and RNA binding proteins, that bind R RNA binding proteins that will either enhance or suppress the use of splice sites. So in this cartoon, you can see exonic, um, there, use my pointer, exonic splice enhancers or suppressors um, that will affect utilization of um, splice acceptor sites. And sometimes they could be in introns. So if you look at um, the PAL1F1 alpha isoform compared to a consensus, it's a terrible match. It has a lousy score, 75 out of 100. And yet, that's the one that's typically utilized. Then you look at the beta isoform, it has a great score and it looks great compared to the consensus, but it's not usually utilized very to a much extent. And so right away that tells you there must be some splice enhancers and suppressors around here that are making this, help make this choice. And the variants we uh, were found in the various patients are shown here, they're all, um, U to G changes in the RNA that could influence um, binding of, of uh, splice enhancers or repressors. So Peter um, made an expression, um, used a standard exon trap assay where you basically just clone your exon of, of interest with a little bit of flanking DNA into this multiple cloning site of this vector and it has some uh, artificial exons nearby and you have forward and reverse primers, transfect the cells, harvest the RNA, do some RT-PCR and you can quantify how often do you use this splice site versus that one. And what he found was just crystal clear. Um, here's the wild type uh, exon two cloned in and you're getting a product that's 100% alpha, alpha isoform, the activator. And each of the variants gives you the beta isoform only. So that tells us the mechanism of action is by losing the activator and creating a dominant negative repressor that's going to knock out the function of the other allele. So again, um, Jacob uh, Kissman's lab and Kathy Smith and before her Miriam Markarova um, offered to dive in and try to create a functional catalog that would tell us where are the variants that cause switching. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because Kathy has just done a beautiful job and she's a graduate student in your program and you're going to hear it all straight from her at one of her talks, I'm sure. But just to simplify, what what she did was to take, um, to mutagenize every single base pair that you could possibly mutate in the exon and surrounding intronic regions. 
take those in batch with a barcode so you can tell which mutation is with which variant, transpect the cells in bulk, and do next generation sequencing and deconvolute the material. And I'll just give this little teaser here that um, she put together that shows a cartoon of this exon. And here you can see each of the different variants that caused beta isoform um, switching. And that includes the variants that were found in the patients, of course, but also some other ones that we hadn't found. So this is exactly what we needed to then go back to other data that we had and say, wait a minute, are there any patients that have these variants that were maybe overlooked before because they weren't predicted to be pathogenic? And yes, there were. So when Sebastian went through the Argentinian cohort, he found this family where there was an affected father and son with growth hormone deficiency and severe pituitary hypoplasia. There's no amino acid change, but it's exactly one of the nucleotide changes that's predicted to cause isoform switching. So for the, this uh, a question, I think some, somebody's raising their hand. Do I have to unmute them? Microphone permission, okay. How do I get that? Uh, participants. I don't see anyone raising their hand. I think I saw Jack and Jack. Jacob Schitzman. Yeah, Jacob looks like, and somebody said microphone permission, but I don't know how to switch it. What do I do? Can you help us with that? Okay. The user should be able to just unmute themselves. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. It looked to me like Jacob might just be gesturing. All right. Well, um, let, let me go on and um, please uh, put your questions in the chat or, or uh, jump in. So we have 200 new patients under analysis. And one of the things we're really hoping we might be able to figure out is um, if there's any evidence for digenic disease. So there is, for some neuroendocrine disorders, evidence that in some rare Mendelian families, you have recessive loss of function alleles that create disease. But a lot of patients have a load of heterozygous deleterious alleles that adds up to cause disease. And so that's something we're going to look for. We have to do copy number variant detection because we don't, um, we, we aren't able to get that from our um, data that we have so far. And we're really enthusiastic about these high throughput functional studies so that we can create catalogs because it's just not tenable for individual labs to be able to set up all these different assays for different genes. And then we hope in the future that we can do exome or genome sequencing for the cases that are unsolved in this cohort, which is quite a few. Um, so historically, the genes that we know about have been identified by uh, using cell lines, uh, pituitary cell lines and mouse models. And that's something that my lab has historically done. So I want to tell you a couple vignettes from that approach to sifting out candidates. Because, you know, when you get your catalog of variant alleles, the first thing you do that's unbiased is start looking at them in a biased way, where you look and see where are they expressed? What do we know about them? Is there a mouse mutant? Is it some pioneer gene that we don't have any idea what it does? Usually those don't get that much attention. Um, so I think that uh, the biology is very uh, good partner to the human genetic studies. So Alex uh, Daly just finished his PhD in human genetics and um, he undertook the utilization of pituitary cell lines to find downstream targets of that critical transcription factor POW1F1 that we were just talking about. And that's what I want to tell you about next. Um, so you see here, this was the first gene that was discovered that caused pituitary hormone deficiency. And there's this whole cohort that are not well explained. What we know about POW1F1 
is that it's critical for these three cell types and for those hormones. And there's a pituitary cell line um, called GHFT1 that represents the progenitor to that lineage. It expresses POW and F1, but no hormones. So it's like a naive, a committed, but naive still progenitor. And then there's a cell line that was developed that's called T-alpha T1 that represents the thyrotrope. They make TSH and it's amazing. They can even follow a circadian rhythm, respond to hypothalamic hormones and thyroid hormone feedback. So they're, they behave really nicely like a real thyrotrope. And what Alex set out to do is look and see what are the differences between these two cell lines in terms of genomic changes, the epigenome and transcription factors, because something must be happening to allow this transcription factor to drive three different cell fates. It's clearly not doing it by itself. So what are the other ones? Just a little physiology here for you. Um, Sorry about the phone ringing. Um, the hypothalamus produces thyrotropin releasing hormone, which regulates pituitary production of thyroid stimulating hormone or thyrotropin. And that acts at the level of the thyroid gland um, to uh, cause the thyroid to grow, develop, and produce thyroid hormones. And there's exquisite feedback loops so that both the pituitary and the brain sense the overall level of metabolism, body temperature, all of the things that are needed to maintain metabolism. So in addition to congenital problems with hypothyroidism, if not corrected, that can cause um, intellectual disability, um, growth defects, and permanent deafness. Um, Thyroid, pituitary thyroid function can decline with age. And in this uh, Colorado study that was done by Chip Ridgway's group, they found uh, a high percentage of adults with thyroid dysfunction. And why should we care about this? Well, it makes you feel bad. Hypothyroidism can cause fatigue, weight gain, cold sensitivity, um, muscle weakness. And excess thyroid hormone is also bad. It can cause um, irregular heartbeat and uh, other issues. So maintaining this balance is important, not just for children, but also for adults. So what Alex set out to do um, with uh, Steve Parker's help is to use all the latest omics technologies and apply to these cell lines, the progenitor and the differentiated cell. And so he did RNA sequencing to define the transcriptome he did a tax seek, which is assay for accessible chromatin to identify areas of the genome that were active that differed between the cell lines. And this cut and run technology, which is a new version of chip seek that allows you to look at active and repressed uh, marks uh, on the histones, as well as for differential power one F1 binding. And then he used the bioinformatic pipeline to determine what classes of transcription factors were likely influencing POW and F1 in those cell lines. And we think those are great candidates for pituitary disease. So this is a slide Alex made to just remind us what these marks are. Um, the histone um, acetylation and methylation marks um, that are associated with active versus repressed genes and the cut and run uh, was the technique that he used to, to um, find those sites genome-wide. And then a tax seek was to look for areas of open chromatin. You can see here in this cartoon how there's accessible areas of DNA associated with active genes. So just as a sanity check, let's look at pow one f one our favorite gene. It's expressed in both cell lines. Here's the cartoon of the gene. By the RNA-seq, you can see, yep, it's expressed. All the exons are there. And then you start looking at uh, pow one f one binding. I told you it auto-regulates itself through enhancers. There they are. It's binding to those enhancer sites in both cell lines. 
um, you can see the active um, histone marks and areas of open chromatin at the promoter and enhancer regions in both cell lines. So this all made perfect sense. It's like, okay, the experiment worked. Uh, this is kind of like the positive control. What about the rest of the pal one f one binding sites? It's, it's really like a third, a third, a third, uh, unique to the two uh, cell lines and the same. So, and this is overall. So then what Alex did is he drilled down and he looked like, what about just the promoter areas? And there, it's not so different. So it looks like pow f one is binding to various promoters, mostly uh, almost 70% the same in both cell lines. But where it's different is at other sites, at in, um, putative enhancer sites away from the promoters. And those are the unique things. So then he ran his uh, pow one f one binding sites through a bioinformatics pipeline to find out what is the consensus for whatever's binding here. And he found the pow one f one consensus. Okay, that makes perfect sense. That's what should be found there. That's the um, um, homodimer motif for pow one f one. And the, then he asked the question, what else is there? And in the progenitor cell line, he finds uh, the BZIP transcription factor consensus. Um, and an example of a BZIP factor would be FRAU1. And that suggests that some of those unique enhancer sites that pow one f one binds in the progenitor may also be cooperatively bound with the, with the FRA1 factor or other BZIP type factors. And of course, from his RNA-seq, he can generate a whole list of potential candidates in that family. Then in the thyrotrope uh, cell line, he found uh, two motifs in addition to the pow one f one motif. And that's uh, helix turn helix and basic helix loop helix. And I thought this was super exciting because RFX factors are important in the development, this family in the deport, uh, development of other neurosensory systems. So the neurosensory cells of the ear, and they're also important for the development of the pancreatic endocrine cells, the insulin producing cells. So these, the, these are great candidates for things that might be important in pituitary differentiation that we haven't known about yet. The helix loop helix factor, these are, this is a big family. So there might be a lot of redundancy and overlap. Um, in the zebra fish, if you knock out ASCL1, you lose the whole pituitary gland. That doesn't happen in the mammal because there's more overlap. Um, but I think this is a real cool entree for us to find new factors that cooperate with pow one f one to derive these different cell fates. One of the factors that um, Alex noted was GATA2. Um, it's in this volcano plot of RNA-seq in the differentiated cell, the thyrotrope-like cell, it's highly, highly expressed. So if we look at GATA2, you can see here um, that it's strongly expressed in the thyrotrope-like cell line. And there are pow one f one sites that are uh, upstream of it and a pow one f one site that's very far distal, many, many KB3 prime of the gene. And I think this may be not yet well appreciated in the field, but once we've mined all the exomes we can, and we still haven't explained disease, we've got to look at regulatory elements. And so we really need to know where they are. Um, that's like the dark matter of the genome. And information like this that Alex put together helps us to annotate areas of the genome that are likely important for regulation and could be places where there are copy number variants or things that affect um, gene expression. And one thing that's really neat about what Alex did is he took, uh, he didn't stop just with the epigenetic, epigenomic uh, classification. He actually cloned these pieces in forward and reverse direction and did transcription assays and was able to prove that uh, there are several elements here that uh, have strong effects on GATA2 expression in um, pituitary thyrotropes, including this element that's really far away. So I, th 
I'm not showing you everything he did. It's just a couple of vignettes uh, to get a flavor. Um, similarly for TSH beta, that's the hormone beta subunit. It's critical. And um, this gene, um, people have studied the promoter, but they've never really looked beyond the first KB or so around the gene. And what Alex found was this region that binds PAL and F1, that's seven KB away, that really had the hallmarks of an enhancer in the differentiated cells that express it. And it's totally silent here in the cells that don't express it. So he checked that and, sure, and some other elements that look like they might be of interest. And he found that this element here, um, seven KB away, was uh, really uh, active um, for an, an enhancer. And he went on and showed that um, PAL1, F1, and GATA2 interact on that enhancer. So this is, these are expression studies where he's uh, using the TSH beta <clears throat> element promoter uh, here, promoter proximal region, and adding in PAL1, F1. You can see it does a little, not too much. You add GATA2, it does a little more, and you put them together and you get even more transcription. So that's not news. But what is news is this, this extra element that he found where he could show that GATA2 has a really strong effect on that element as well as PAL1F1. We're not seeing additivity, but we can see that they both act there. So um, he also tried using that element to make transgenic mice to see if it was enough to give cell-specific expression, and it was. These are slices from two different pituitary transgenics, and the endogenous TSH is in, stained in green, and uh, the transgenic reporter is in red. So everywhere you see yellow, that's a coincidence. Um, and um, the majority of the transgene labeled cells were thyrotropes. So it does have cell specificity in vivo. So what Alex accomplished in his PhD, I think is really great. It's a genome-wide transcriptomic and epigenomic analysis of pituitary thyrotropes. He identified PAL1FM binding sites that are specific to progenitors and differentiated cells identified the classes of factors that might be associated with those unique sites, um, and has predicted key re regulatory elements for many pituitary genes, and taken that to the next level of doing functional studies. I think the knowledge of these regulatory regions is going to be really important for the next level of disease genetics. And now in the last minutes, I'm gonna tell a vignette um, about single cell transcriptomics. Um, and uh, Leonard Chung is a research investigator in the lab who really spearheaded this work. And if you have open slots in your next series of the seminar, you might wanna hear from Leonard because he's got a great story. And he's out on the job market. So um, if you see any great job ads, put them Leonard's way. Um, so the reason this single cell transcriptomics has been really interesting is because we can look at very rare cell types and we can look at cells that are transitioning to differentiate. And I think this is gonna be really powerful in understanding pituitary adenomas, which we didn't talk about here, but it's a whole nother cause of um, pituitary dysfunction. And the origin of these adenomas is something that's, we need more markers to, to be predictive. So I think this is really a cool area. So Leonard took advantage of the U of M Advanced Genomics Core and used their 10X Genomics um, platform um, to do the single cell analysis. And just very superficially, what this involves is taking the tissue and dispersing it to single cells in a where you have an overabundance of the barcoded beads per cell, so that you're gonna have only one cell with one barcode. And then you can get the transcripts that are associated with one particular cell. And he has, like I said, pioneered this in my lab and has published a couple of papers recently of this technology. And so I'm gonna show some of his unpublished 
um, work. The first paper was just kind of a proof of principle. If we take an adult pituitary gland, disperse it to single cells, does it come out the way we think? Is there anything interesting there? And it's very cool. Um, you can see the most of the cells here make growth hormone. That's that orange population. Here are ones that make prolactin, the ones that make gonadotropins. Um, there are pituitary stem cells. So this is a rare cell type in the adult, but they're very important and very interesting for us. And we've, he identified a population of cells that express POW1F1 that aren't yet making hormones. So these are like those progenitors um, that those cell lines represent that I was just telling you about. And um, what about the thyrotropes? Well, that was a little disappointing. Um, we expected them to be a rare cell type, but not more rare than stem cells in adults. We only got a, less than 1%. And so we're really interested in that cell type because they're so important for health. So uh, we decided to take the tack of enriching for them using a genetic marking technique. And so we do this by making transgenic animals that drive Cre recombinase under the control of the TSHB, the regulatory elements. And then we mate that with a strain that's already developed that will only express a fluorescent marker like YFP in response to Cre recombinase. And so um, when Leonard did this, he got great enrichment for thyrotropes. Um, so this just shows a picture with a LAC-Z reporter, beta-galactosidase in blue. Instead of YFP, you can see the cells that are making TSH and they're marked. This is from a different experiment that Alex did, but it gives you an idea of what you would see in the fluorescence activated cell sorter, um, where there aren't that many fluorescent cells um, in a wild type pituitary that autofluorescence is not a problem. Um, and then you get more. And if you do some other tricks, you can really enrich and get a lot of um, thyrotropes. So we expected to find at least two populations of thyrotropes when we did this. Um, this is some data that's been published for a long time, and it's uh, from E15 and a half embryos, and it's TSH in C2 hybridization. And you see, oh, there's a bunch of TSH cells in the main corpus of the pituitary gland, anterior lobe. And then there's this rostral tip area here that also seems to be TSH expressing. But when you compare that with the POW1F1, you can see these populations are different. This main population is POW1F1 positive, but these other ones over here are not. Um, and what we think these uh, rostral tip thyrotropes of, of development end up being are the thyrotropes that are present in a structure called the pars tuberalis. So look over here in this diagram, you can see there's some pituitary-like tissue that's sort of smashed up here against the bottom of the hypothalamus going up towards the brain. And it's thought that these cells, hormone producing cells in this region, are in contact with the pineal gland and that they're um, regulated by uh, photoperiod and circadian rhythm. And they, they differ uh, from the typical thyrotrope that's here in the anterior lobe in, in this corpus, in that they don't respond to the typical feedback that I was telling you about the hypothalamus regulating pituitary and the thyroid gland feeding back. They don't have the receptors to sense that feedback. So they're doing something else and it's thought that it has to do with this photoperiod and um, circadian rhythm. So anyway, back to Leonard's experiment. What he did, this is a, like kind of the, the experimental design where he took uh, young animals and I think that's a key uh, step because if we look at younger animals when the pituitary is still growing right after birth, we have the opportunity to catch things that are those developmental intermediates um, before everything is all locked in. 
So um, he did the, used the genetic marking technique and mixed those cells in with cells from Cree negative animals. So we have um, them together in the analysis. And here's some of the results. Um, this is just part of the illustration of the cluster analysis of the individual cells. It's not showing the whole pituitary, but we're seeing the area that's of interest for this part of the talk. And that's uh, the, in the center thing, you can see all of the cells um, in blue and there are certain areas that are blocked off. And then if you look at the lineage marked cells, you can see where they overlay. And since we enriched the, that orange area kind of obliterates the other area. And you can see it, it also fills in this area with a lot more cells. And you can see over here in the area that he's annotated that the POW1F1 negative thyrotropes account for a big chunk of these uh, cells. And then over here are the typical thyrotropes th that we expected that are express POW1F1, but those seem to cluster into two groups, which we had not anticipated. If you drill down a little bit more into the expression in these cells in this red to blue paint, you can see where TSH beta is highest. And it's really high in the typical thyrotrope. It's not too bad in these atypical ones, and it's not too bad in these POW1F1 negative ones. And this is quantified here, transcripts um, for each of these types, the typical and the um, atypical and the POW1F1 negative. So for the POW1F1 negative cells that I'm asserting are the pars 2 aralis thyrotropes, um, what um, other markers do they have? You can see they're pretty weak to negative for POW1F1, but they're really strong for GATA2, and they're expressing both of the alpha and the beta subunits of this hormone. And so the cool part is when Leonard dives down and see what else is expressed there that might be interesting. And he found cholecystokinin, uh, the TSH receptor. So these cells are responding to TSH, VEGF, and the transcription factor SOX14. Um, SOX14 is a very exciting um, thing to follow up on. Um, the mice that express this exist and they have uh, some interesting features in terms of circadian rhythm and sleep. And this is something that Leonard hopes to follow up on in the future to examine the pituitaries. You can see here the uh, robust GFP expression in the hypothalamus, the arcuate nucleus, and the pars tuberalis of the pituitary. So do these cells have any chance to contribute to disease? We think they do, um, and evidence of this is a recent paper just last year from the Hul Datani's group in the UK, where they associated mutations in L1 cam um, with congenital hypopituitarism um, with additional syndromic features. And you can see here from the Allen Brain Atlas that this is expressed in that rostral tip population of cells. What about these atypical cells, the ones that were sort of a surprise? Um, it turns out they express this orphan nuclear receptor, NR5A1, also known as steroidogenic factor one. It's a gonadotrope transcription factor. You can see it's pretty robustly expressed in that atypical group. And they also express a little bit of luteinizing hormone beta subunit shown here. Not as robust as the gonadotropes, but it's there and there are other markers. So when we think about this, what does it mean? We, we, we typically thought about the POW1F1 lineage driving these three cell fates and NR5A1 together with GATA2 and islet one driving this other fate. But then if you stop to think about it, these hormones are evolutionarily related. They're derived from a common progenitor. 
and there's other common transcription factors. So maybe what we have is not a separate POW1 F1 to this fate and NR5A1 to this fate, but an actual intermediate cell type that expresses both of those lineage specific transcription factors and is kind of in an ambidextrous fate and it can go either way based on other cues. So Leonard collaborated with um, Gary Hammer's lab who has an NR5A1 Cree transgenic line and um, look to see uh, if cells that express NR5A1 turned into thyrotropes. And it looks like they do. And you can see that here, the, um, the cells that are green are um, GFP. They're actually labeled here in red. Um, but you can see that there's a lot of co-expression of the lineage trace marker in red with the TSH beta, and it's 30%. And I think this makes sense. Uh, not just because he sees the population in single cell and he can verify it with lineage trace, but also there's a class of pituitary adenomas that don't make hormone that make both of these transcription factors. So I think these, this is a very exciting um, uh, discovery tool going forward. So to just uh, summarize and, and wrap up, the single cell, um, we got a great enrichment for thyrotropes. We found a novel population that looks like an intermediate between two fates. And um, we think that the pars tuberalis uh, cells that are, are rare, not very abundant, that this enrichment has allowed us to come up with candidate genes for pituitary disease from that population. So in summary, I think these three somewhat disparate projects all work together to advance our understanding of the genetic causes of hypopituitarism. Um, splicing variants may be really underappreciated cause of disease that we can dive into as we go forward. Um, the pituitary epigenomics has really helped us to develop a catalog of potential regulatory elements that I think will be important as we move forward in CNB detection and interpretation. And finally, the single cell transcriptomics, I think, is very powerful uh, for gene discovery um, and for capturing these differentiation intermediates and cancer cell types. So I want to thank everybody in the lab um, who did all this beautiful work and Jacob Kitzman's lab, particularly Kathy Smith and Miriam, who, who started the SPLICE project and um, everybody else that's helped, especially the collaborators, endocrinologists, um, patients and families that agreed to participate in genetic studies. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, thanks Sally. It's beautiful, beautiful work. <clears throat> All right, um, so you can either um, unmute yourself and ask a question or type it in the chat and I'll read it for you. Maybe while we're waiting for uh, people to think of questions, I can start. Um, Sally, I was curious, are there any prospects for, for using organoids to chase down some of the mechanisms for these variants that you're studying? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Yes, there are. There have been several groups around the world that have been successful in making pituitary organoids. Um, we haven't tried it in our lab yet. Um, but um, I think it's something that would be great to implement. There was a paper uh, that Hironori Bando presented to our group just this, just this past week that um, where they used pituitary stem cells to make organoids. And it seemed like it was a lot less labor intensive than trying to take IPS cells or um, embryonic stem cells to make the organoids. Um, one of the challenges with organoids is that the differentiation efficiency is poor. So it would be nice to have a marker so you could fluorescent, you know, see that which organoids are actually differentiating so you could focus your technique and 
that's something that Leonard's interested in pursuing on his own. Very cool. But then you could end, you could CRISPR in whatever you wanted for patient variants and see how they affected differentiation. It's not fast. It takes about a hundred days for them to differentiate, um, but it still can, could give you an answer. Great, thanks. Um, okay, so we've got one question in the chat here from Lori Reitzman. My question is about the GHFT1 and TAT1 experiments. This is a really powerful way to look for important enhancer regions. Does immortalization of the cells change their epigenetic landscape significantly and does it change enhancer usage? I think that's a really good question, thanks. I don't know the answer, but I suspect that it's going to be yes, that there are going to be changes. I mean, there almost have to be for them to be actively proliferating the way they are. Um, so one of the things that would be nice to be able to do in the future is uh, these technologies of the cut and run and the attack seek have been optimized so you can use them on smaller and smaller groups of cells. So you might be able to do some of the enrichment the way Leonard did to fax sort cells of interest and then look at those um, using these technologies. I, but I, I think it is nice that the ones, the enhancers that we know about, you know, we did find those. So there is some reality check there. Yes? Sorry, I jumped in a little early. Just to follow up on the uh, failure, if you will, to find a genetic cause for the Argentinian patients and in the retrospective studies, I mean, is there any evidence that there is a genetic cause? I mean, could these be non-genetically driven changes in pituitary development? Uh, are there ways from studying the distribution of the mothers in terms of age or environmental effects to actually deduce whether the causes are genetic? Yeah, that's an important point, um, Tom. Thanks for asking. It's known that uh, things like septo-optic dysplasia are more common in very young, like preteen mothers. And so it's almost certainly there is a, an environmental impact and maybe some of these really aren't genetic at all. Um, it's also been shown in animal models that if you take a genetic hit, so there's six genes in the sonic hedgehog pathway that are known to cause hypopituitarism if they have loss of function mutations. But if you take one of those, it's been done with more than one, take one of those genes and you put it on a mouse genetic background that's not susceptible. So you're not seeing anything with a single allele. Then you do something like you introduce alcohol at embryonic day seven for the mouse. And it's not enough to see anything. But if you put them together, the genetic and environmental thing together, then you have a craniofacial abnormality. So we don't, there's no way to know um, what kind of environmental insults have been there, been there during the early, very early weeks of pregnancy. Um, but I suspect that that contributes to the this uh, low solve rate. Um, but I also think we're missing missing some analyses that we we can do. So for certain, so the the copy number detection I think will probably at least double our solve rate. All right, any other questions for Sally? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and um, being part of this um, virtual seminar. Thank you so much. Thank thanks you, Sally, and, and thanks for kicking off our seminar series for the year. It was a great start. It was my, my privilege and honor. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder that we'll have our next seminar next week the same time. And uh, our speaker for the 16th is Joelle Lomano from uh, EPFL in Switzerland. And some of you may know him as the inventor of the RNA velocity algorithm that was published in Nature recently. So it should be a great talk. Hope to see many of you back next, next week. Thanks, Josh.
Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Sally. See everybody next week.